and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. And my guest is Gerald Barnett. And in a bit of a uh, departure, I'm going to let Gerald introduce himself. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Gerald Barnett. Um, uh, Brian called me up and said, let's have a, a discussion about bi Dole and university tech transfer and things like that from an inside perspective. And that's pretty much what I have been doing for the last uh, 20 odd years. Uh, I've been working in university technology transfer settings as a licensing associate, as a uh, director of uh, university uh, scale offices of intellectual property management, first for software and then just for a whole campus, um, patents, copyrights, trademarks, the whole works. Um, I worked at the University of Washington, uh, University of California system at the Santa Cruz campus where we are focused on uh, University of California activity in Silicon Valley. So I spent my time driving over the hill from Santa Cruz to um, the, the Valley locations and back um, as part of my work. Um, and so, uh, and a lot of this, uh, I, I bring a, a perspective that's um, driven by, first of all, practice. Uh, how do you work with people who've identified something inventive or creative, they've collected something, they've got an insight, and they want to do the next thing? What's the next thing they ought to do with what they've got? And that's a really difficult challenge when you look at yourself and say, why should they be talking to me of all people when they've done that? Um, but universities have set it up to make it important that faculty, students, staff, inventors, developers, creators, authors uh, talk to somebody representing the university uh, before they do other things. And some people in the university respect that. Um, they're very dutiful in coming to talk to us, and uh, some people don't respect that. And some of those people who don't respect it have uh, some of my greatest admiration for their willingness to go out and do what needs to be done in the world. And sometimes they even let me uh, traipse along and learn from them what they're capable of doing. So that's the university side of things. And I've spent the last 10 or 12 years really working through the history and background of university technology transfer, how it's developed, uh, what kinds of uh, motivations people have had, what were their ideas about uh, intellectual role of intellectual property, the role of you know the personal consulting initiative, the importance of making things freely available and publishing them. There's lots of conflicting um, you know motivations you know in this area. And also, in particular, things like the Bayh-Dole Act and other federal policies that purport to um, uh, do things that are beneficial for uh, university research or for commercialization or for public benefit. And trying to chase down what in those actual policies, when it's translated into practice, are meaningful. So that's what I've been doing. And that's what I do now. I have a a blog that's run for about 10 years called Research Enterprise at researchenterprise.org. And um, it's where I, I write up the articles that trace the arc of my work to try to make sense of what's going on. Well, so Gerald, one of the reasons I was really interested in talking to you is that you have a really kind of rich and interesting perspective on the history of university patent policies and tech transfer offices and so on. And in particular, I, I was really interested in your perspective on, on Baidul. So I was wondering if, if you could kind of give a precis, as it were, of the Bayh-Dole Act from your perspective and sort of correct some of the misconceptions that people might might have about it. Yeah, it's a, that's a very challenging uh, request. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to say and expect to be believed that almost everything you read about Bayh-Dole is not true. And yet, there's a great body of 
very consistent and very wrong literature about Baidol. And that makes it very difficult because if I were to say, well, most things are generally true and all I'm trying to do is adjust little details of technical claims about the law or just arguing the policy that must be standing behind the law, everybody's fine with that. They say, well, that's what we all do. Right? To say, you know, the, the law as it's written and the basis for that law in the executive branch patent policies, the federal procurement regulation, and the institutional patent agreement programs of the NIH and the NSF, um, you get to a very different point. And so if we talk about by Dole, we can talk about it in terms of the law. We can turn, talk in terms about the history of what happened before and after by Dole, and we can talk in terms of practice and how does by Dole uh, affect actual university uh, or university faculty practice with regard to, say, inventions. With regard to the history, misconception number one is that somehow Baidol is a watershed moment for the creation of university technology transfer programs. Utterly not true. You can look at uh, David Mowry's work um, and see a, a good history of of the development of university tech transfer, but really it traces back to the watershed events being the formation of Research Corporation in 1912 to handle the electrostatic precipitator invention made by a faculty member at the University of California. Isn't it great to have an environmental technology coming out of the University of California a uh, hundred and some years ago? And that Research Corporation then is set up as a nonprofit, as an act of Congress to, with industry representatives to receive and evaluate uh, university faculty inventions and make them available to industry and take any licensing revenue and turn that over to the Smithsonian Institution to be distributed as research funding throughout America. Um, that's Research Corp. It's not quite how it operates now, but that's how it was started. And there's some really interesting discussions around that. Um, Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation is formed in 1925. It is affiliated with the University of Wisconsin-Madison. It exists to take a set of vitamin D uh, inventions um, and market those to industry and at the same time commits itself to protecting the Wisconsin dairy industry and gets itself into all sorts of antitrust trouble after a few years because it is denying um, the right of manufacturers to include this vitamin D introducing technology into margarines rather than into butters. And this disadvantages the poor and therefore uh, ends up being an antitrust situation. But Wharf exists to take those royalties, invest them in the stock market, make a pile of money from the stock investments and gift the university every year uh, an annual amount that it can use for research and therefore produce more inventions that it can manage and uh, like that. So the Wharf model and the research corporation model run in parallel for uh, decades. Uh, many universities start their own affiliated research foundations, you know, really scores of universities with these foundations. Some still have them, some don't. Um, it was only in the 1970s, really, that 1960s and 70s, that some universities started having their own university-based licensing operations, that is internal, directed by and responsible to the university administration. Um, early instances, University of California uh, started around 1960 with an office. All disclosures were voluntary. Uh, faculty participate. The purpose of the office was to generate royalties that could be used to augment the research activities of the university. Again, at the time, 1960, there is no lot of federal funding. It's just been ramping up for a few years. The National Science Foundation's only, you know, less than a, a decade old, and they still haven't really figured out how they're going to start funding lots and lots of research. And so getting some money from royalties seems like a sort of a good idea. Um, 
you know, Stanford follows in the 1970s, MIT, um, and they create a, a, a different model and all of these, you know, activities then start to form around what I call the Nails Reimer model of university licensing. That is, it's not a tech transfer office, it's a technology licensing office. The idea is take invention disclosures from your faculty, reevaluate them for their possible um, commercial significance and patent significance. And if those things converge, there's a good commercial significance, there's a reason to have a patent, then patent it and license it to industry. And yeah, sounds really good. Um, the watershed event for Baidol is that it makes it appear that universities would be better off with an internal technology licensing office than to have an external agent being selective about what to take under management and operate independently, if you wish, of the university. That's the big watershed moment in Baidol. Um, but Baidol was represented to provide universities with outright ownership of inventions made in research involving federal support. So the word that went out and that got transmitted through organizations such as Autumn, the Association of University Technology Managers, which at the time was SUPA, Society of University Patent Administrators, um, was that Baidol required university ownership and either vested that ownership of inventions directly in universities and nonprofits as hosts of federally funded research, or universities had a first right of refusal, or uh, inventors were constrained and they had to only assign to the university they couldn't assign to anyone else um, without federal approval. And there was various theories, and the fact that there were various theories um, suggests that they really didn't have any straight grounding in the law, because if there had been something in the law that said ownership vests with the institution that hosts the research, then you wouldn't have a theory about it. You would just have a citation to the law, um, but there wasn't one. This all came to a head um, in the law case, Supreme Court case, eventually Stanford versus Roche. And that case, you know, Stanford is arguing that an invention that uh, was uh, arguably made with federal support um, uh, should vest with Stanford and therefore it have the right to uh, sue Roche for having used the invention to make a, a diagnostic kit to evaluate you know, AIDS interventions. And so the ideas behind Baidol that you see in the popular literature uh, turn out to actually misrepresent the law and the history of university tech transfer. Baidol didn't start university tech transfer offices. It created a, an administrative opportunity to convert uh, external invention management into internal invention management. There's nothing in Baidol that stipulates this or requires it. It was something that administrators at universities took advantage of um, in representing the law. Um, in terms of the law itself, uh, the Supreme Court was very clear. Uh, the contracting provisions in Baidol apply to subject inventions, that is, inventions of a contractor. And the Supreme Court was clear that of means ownership, that it's not an invention made under the auspices of uh, an employer. It is an invention that the employer has come to own, has come to acquire. And there's ways that inventions may be acquired by an employer or another uh, party, and those generally involve uh, a written assignment. Um, and when there's not a written assignment, generally requires some finding of equitable title based on assigning an inventor to a person to invent or assigning them to do experimental work and having uh, essentially an employer's control over that person for the purpose of inventing. And if you don't have that, then you get a shop right um, and if they've used your resources, but you don't get a, a claim to ownership. And Baidol is represented as having provided 
uh, universities with a legitimate claim to own anything made with, uh, you know, in work receiving federal funds. And it just isn't the case. And the Supreme Court was very clear about this. Uh, universities haven't been. So you start out by these basic premises of Baidol that there was a big change that um, Baidol provided uh, uh, ownership to the universities and that somehow this ownership of inventions by the universities is a really good thing. And we get to the third problem with Baidol, and that is that the metrics of its success have been uh, manipulated and uh, understated and you know, are misleading. That you actually don't have any um, good statistics on the use of Baidol inventions, subject inventions, um, on the metrics that Baidol itself proposes. Um, Baidol makes all contractor invention use reports secret. So we don't have access to those to evaluate them for what inventions made with uh, federal funding um, have in fact um, become used. Um, it's all secret. You can't get that information. In its place, there are a number of organizations that report uh, what are best proxies for Baidol success. The Association of University Technology Managers has an annual licensing survey, but that survey doesn't break out subject inventions from all other inventions. It appears that about 60% of university patenting involves non-subject inventions. 40% um, are federally uh, supported. And so the autumn licensing statistics um, aren't any help in evaluating the actual impact of Baidol because they don't actually break out what Baidol has done. Other organizations promote the idea that Baidol has resulted in, some people say, 200 um, drugs and vaccines, and yet nobody produces the list of what those drugs or vaccines are. And when you look closely, they're not saying that those are drugs and vaccines that are based on a federally supported invention. They say these are a result of a public-private partnership. Well, that could mean that a university at some point does a clinical trial. Well, that doesn't have anything to do with the patents that might under, under, underlie the inventions that might have been made. That just has to do with the university serving as a contractor to run a clinical trial. And universities routinely in clinical trial agreements agree to give up all ownership claims and any inventions they might make as a result of running the clinical trial. And so in those environments, um, we don't have good information about how Baidol has actually resulted in uh, beneficial use. And the standard of in Baidol for inventions is that the patent system is used to promote the use of inventions arising from federally supported research or development. The standard for the federal government to march in when uh, a patent owner of a subject invention uh, fails to achieve public benefit um, is practical application or uh, reasonable availability. And practical application is the use of an invention such that the benefits of the use are available to the public on reasonable terms. And nowhere in Baidol does anybody track and report their achievement of practical application. Even though Baidol identifies for its reporting that one of the things that a federal agency could ask for but doesn't have to is the date of first commercial uh, sale or use. And even if we just had the date of first commercial sale or use tied to each invention that was owned by a university and made with federal support, then we'd start to be able to see at least what the outputs were from Baidol. But we don't have that. And so anybody who claims that Baidol is a rip roaring success is making a statement based on their own personal belief, but there's any empirical evidence that they can point to to back it. 
And when I've chased down that evidence, when it's been presented, I don't find anything of substance that comes remotely close to suggesting that Baidol has been even as effective at the licensing activity um, involving inventions that the universities were for non-federally supported uh, inventions. Um, and so those are the, the kinds of things that one gets into with Baidol is that people appear to like it. They think it's good. Even when they don't like Baidol, they acknowledge that it appears to be successful. And yet it's an appearance. And when you look at the practice point of view, there's very little about Baidol that recommends it as a, a benefit to invention management, um, to innovation, to public benefit, uh, especially public benefit. Uh, on reasonable terms. And even if you look at the money being made by the big hit patent licenses that universities will recite, you still have to go back and say, so are those lucrative drugs, those blockbuster drugs being made available to the public on reasonable terms? And if you look at the drug debate about drug pricing, There'd be many people in the public who say simply those aren't reasonable terms. 100,000, 200,000 a year um, to try to save my life is not a reasonable term. Well, so I, I, mean, I wonder if you could talk a little bit as well about the incentives internally on tech transfer managers, because this is something that I thought was really interesting that you were saying, and like not something I think that people from the outside really understand very well. Like when university tech transfer offices and universities in general are making decisions about how to proceed with their patent policies, what are they responding to? That's a really tough one. It's you know the the idea of an incentive in tech transfer is itself problematic that you you seem to think that there are incentives. And it may be that there are, you know, a fear of sanctions, that it may be that you don't want to have something bad happen on your watch. You don't want something to slip out the back door. You don't want, these are terms that people use. You don't want to have a lawsuit. You don't want to have double licensing. Uh, you don't want to be found not in compliance. Uh, it may be that there are fewer incentives around university tech transfer then there are desires to avoid uh, problems and that it's it's clear that broadly um, people in tech transfer strive to generate revenue from their intellectual property positions they revenue is good. Revenue pays their salaries. Revenue reimburses their patenting costs. Revenue uh, provides money to administrators who then think fondly of technology transfer offices. Revenue provides money to inventors that once or twice a decade changes somebody's actual living conditions in life because it's a lot of money. And most of the time, it doesn't amount to much more than a couple of meals out a year, um, which can be nice, but isn't really very meaningful relative to what a faculty member might make consulting um, or just moving to a new university that pays well. And so the the idea that there are incentives that somehow patent, the patent monopoly is an incentive doesn't really uh, work unless somebody has made the case in, in their own mind that a monopoly is the best way to generate revenue. But if you look at the Cohen Boyer inventions, for instance, for gene splicing, um, Stanford licenses them non exclusively and deliberately sets the licensing fee so low that really no company can bother to think about it. They just pay it. And um, Stanford makes, you know, to what, 260 million. Um, and so a non exclusive licensing program can be lucrative while the terms of access are really reasonable. Um, it's just that most universities haven't followed the Cohen Boyer model and instead seek a single licensee to represent their interests and so forth, preserve the patent monopoly rather than break it up and make the invention broadly available under your patent rights. 
and charge a, a reasonable access fee for doing so. So the idea that there are incentives, I mean, the other incentive that I see uh, routinely in university tech transfer offices is some dedication to public service. It's somehow by doing these things, one not only makes money for the university, but motivates some outside entities, a company, an investor, a venture capitalist firm investing in a startup to put the money in that allows some university-based or hosted invention to become reality as a commercial product. And that is you know, seen as a, a public good. It's motivating. Um, is it an incentive? Not really. These are things that you're asked to do and often you're very willing to do. So, you know, I don't know if that's some insight is that the, the problem with uh, attaching idea of public benefit to holding a monopoly on behalf of a single other company is that you then are implicitly excluding a whole range of uses of that invention for research within other universities, for research in industry, for internal use or professional use in industry. They don't need a commercial product. Um, I've talked with lab medicine folk who say, look, when somebody publishes a new diagnostic assay, we can actually implement that assay relatively quickly and actually do a better job of implementing the assay than the people who published it. But if there's a patent attached to that assay, then we can't actually use it. Or if we're going to use it, we have to pay some sort of fee based on the idea that they have a patent. Um, and that's really actually counterproductive to our medical interventions. And so there's many uses for research-based inventions that don't involve creating something that's mass market commercially produced. That would come later after you've demonstrated that there's use in research, use in internal use. And what people are looking for now is standardization, or they're looking for mass production and availability, or features that allow somebody who doesn't have uh, uh, expert or sophisticated uh, capabilities um, to also use and benefit. And so um, in those environments, to, I, commitment to commercialization is also a commitment to move away from uh, cumulative technology, standards, um, open innovation, uh, drawing in and collaborating with others who have, bring their own expertise and their own technology. You're excluding those people from what you believe is an engine of innovation. And even though you believe that what you're doing has great um, public value, you're not looking at the things that you are choosing to suppress that also might have great public value. And so that's another problem that centers around the idea of patent monopolies and that somehow Bayh-Dole mandates them as a public good to be owned and managed by university administrators, not by the inventors, not by public agencies, and not by industry itself. Mm. Well, so Gerald, I mean, I, I wonder, like, from your perspective, if we wanted university innovation policy to be more efficient and more effective, whether from a kind of university administration perspective or tech transfer perspective, or from like a kind of broader policy governmental perspective in terms of thinking about patent policy writ large, like where do you think the points are that would be most effective in kind of practically encouraging universities to do innovation policy in a more efficient way? Well, efficiency is uh, sort of a administrative virtue. Um, I think that what we really need for creativity, innovation, discovery, especially of things like cures or uh, fundamentally new ideas being introduced into science, the whole science endless frontier kind of thing, is less administrative policy not and less efficient policy and more reliance on uh, personal judgment. Uh, more reliance on uh, our confidence in those that are doing the research, having some sense of what would be in the best interests of the science, the public, uh, their own their own work, and uh, have uh, less pre-zoomed administrative insight into what some future 
invention or discovery or insight might be. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to somehow postulate that no matter what you, dear faculty member, might invent or discover or collect or think about, um, we've already anticipated the procedures that would be best for you to follow in taking another step with regard to that uh, thing you've done. And to make that efficient just means you have to somehow prevent there from being exceptions, prevent there from being something that's totally unanticipated, uh, even a unique opportunity. Um, you know, your inventor knows somebody who knows somebody in the company and a couple of referrals and they're on it and doing it um, is way different from something that says before you can talk to him, you have to write the whole thing up as an invention disclosure report and submit it to our office, get it into our databases, and then we'll decide who you get to talk to. Um, just the, you can be efficient about having a ineffective procedure that's been laid out in front by people who don't want to then be later bothered by exceptions. Or you could say, well, maybe we should just start by accepting that uh, free play of free intellects is a foundation for university activity. And we might want to start there. And how would we build a policy about around the free play of free intellects, um, which has been Eva Bush's term in proposing the National Science uh, National Research Foundation, which becomes the NSF in a transmogrified way, um, maybe we need more freedom, more degrees of freedom, less administrative um, confidence that they have things under control, um, more things that are way out there, more things that might give you cause to say, wow, how, why are they doing that? And then we can ask, you know, are there reasons why a faculty might insist that the faculty refrain from patenting in certain areas. And that was the case, for instance, for medical patents, that uh, major universities, you know, medical faculties were insisting that whatever the university's policy on patenting was, uh, there shouldn't be any patenting of uh, medical inventions. That these should be free to be practiced by all. And that's another thing that has been shut down uh, recently, in the, especially in medical, the very thing that faculty were opposed to is now the thing that university administrators insist must be patented, must be licensed exclusively, because the only people that are willing to take an exclusive license or take a license insist on it being exclusive. And that leaves out, again, the idea that in medicine, we don't have standards. Um, while we have them in engineering, while we have them in many other areas, um, we don't have standards as a uh, a possible outcome for university activity. And yet, university if universities said the target was not an exclusive patent license that paid us a lot of money, but was a standard that reflected a broad acceptance of this, in, this invention in the context of other inventions to be used by everybody, then you'd say, well, how many standards has your institution created using your patent positions? And a patent is a perfectly legitimate form of intellectual property to enforce a standard so that people aren't misrepresenting the standard, that they're actually, when they build something and claim it's practicing the standard, it really does, and that you can shut them down if, in fact, they're not practicing the standard when they claim they are, which affects interoperability, affects quality, affects adoption decisions, and say, well, this is unreliable, but it's just because some manufacturer is not practicing the standard. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, I would argue that your starting point is actually to unwind the administrative dominance of activities that are purportedly directed at discovery, uh, invention, adoption, and at some point mass market uh, scale up uh, commercial manufacturing. So that's the counter. The administrators go, no, no, we've fought to have all this. We want you to help us improve our control. And I'm saying, yeah, but for innovation, in fact, weakening your control is historically aligned with innovation. Benoit Godin has you know, studied innovation as a concept in history, and it's sort of the broad reach of innovation is uh, any introduced change to an established order, that the innovation tends to come from outside the order rather than from within it. 
and policies created by an established order tend to be protective of what the established order thinks is important. And the policies that promote innovation tend to be ones that are more like a bill of rights that limit the scope of claim of the established order over new things. So they can't be absorbed so readily into the established order and directed to whatever the established order thinks is going to be good. And there you'd have a, a policy then that would look more like a bill of rights in a university than it would like uh, domination by a uh, corporate entity over its uh, servants and some sort of master uh, servant relationship, which is where employment is as opposed to something where faculty are appointed. And you should get that, Brian, you are an appointed person um, but you're called an employee, but only for those parts of your activity where you agree to institutional control over what you do, which is very rare. You don't agree easily to say, I'm going to let somebody else tell me what to do, other than perhaps they can tell me that I need to meet my class at 930 in the morning, and I'll do that. But at the moment they start to say, you will do this research and not this other research, then you will assert, hey, <laughs> good luck. I have academic, I have, uh, good luck. Yeah. I'm appointed. I have academic freedom. I'm not your servant with regard to my research activity, my publication activity. And a patent is a publication. And the moment somebody says, we're going to force you to publish through the patent literature, you've given up. Your freedom of publication. You don't get to choose the form of your publication. You don't even get to choose the form of your publication because somebody else, a patent attorney or somebody is going to draft it working for the university. And you're mm -hmm. going to be required to approve it. And that's not the same thing as academic freedom. And if you start to say, well, there's, there's challenges in academic freedom. Academic freedom isn't necessarily economic freedom or financial freedom. But if you're going to make the case, then I think a good starting point, and this is where Vannevar Bush was, was that you want to have a Bill of Rights that ensures uh, the intellectual uh, freedom of faculty and students and even staff uh, with regard to their research and creative activities and protect that as much as possible. It's one of the few places in our society that hasn't become dominated by institutional interests, and it shouldn't be. And that would be an argument that says, and Bidol actually allows these things to happen. It's just that administrators have chosen not to point out those parts of the law that would enable inventors to own their own inventions, that would provide guidance with regard to what that might mean with regard to commitments to the public, um, and those would be things that can be mapped out in a policy that says, uh, here's you're free and here's the responsibilities that you will have being a free agent. And if you want institutional help, here's the way that you could get it from us. And that would be a much more, I think, in my mind, productive and historically was a more productive way of going about it than what we have now. Well, so, Gerald, in, in closing, I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on what people studying the university kind of patent infrastructure and and marketplace aren't seeing that you're seeing from the inside right i mean you have a perspective that i think is really interesting on sort of the decisions that people involved in university patent policy are making and i wonder if you could kind of talk a little bit about what people like me are missing yeah, uh, dealing with the, what's happening in university practice is sort of like uh, listening to a football game on the radio broadcast by somebody who wants you to believe that the football game is exciting and therefore calls it the way they want it to be rather than what's actually happening on the field. And if you start to gather all these football calls that are this way, and try to and analyze them statistically for what that might mean, it's very hard to get to what's actually happening on the field, even from an informed expert point of view. So what you're missing is all of the activity that takes place within a technology transfer operation 
and all of the faculty activity and student activity and staff activity that takes place that never makes it into the tech transfer office. There's some faculty have more patents held personally than they have reported to the tech transfer office, or they have more patents that they've assigned to companies they consult for than they have in their tech transfer office. And that's just tracking the patent component, all of the publications that people have that don't have, uh, that might have patent significance, but they've chosen not to consider that in making things available. And these have an impact as well on collaboration, on uh, other work, on the opportunities that others have to then uh, develop or invent or you know, also publish and teach. And so uh, until you actually get into tech transfer offices and uh, win somebody's confidence and trust and that you learn what they're thinking, how they do their, their make their decisions, uh, it's very hard to, based on publicly presented information um, to form a good idea of what you could do to help these people do their jobs, help them avoid doing work that doesn't help anybody else. Um, uh, until you're on the inside, till you're playing the game, um, or at least seeing it clearly, it, it's very hard to do statistical analysis. The, using the autumn data set to do anything other than evaluate the administrative load on a tech transfer office uh, is really problematic. It's an unvalidated data set. Um, Autumn encourages people to estimate where they don't have actual figures, and some universities have estimated relatively liberally. Um, it doesn't have any breakout for patented inventions versus other things called inventions. It has a standard for what constitutes a commercialization license of anything making $1,000 or more, so that can include software and biomaterials you have some special mouse with an itchy butt and you know it can go out for a thousand dollars a pop and there you are have a commercialization license but it doesn't have anything to do with patents or anything else and and so the autumn stats just aren't aren't relevant um they're they're misleading um they they might have a role if you're worried about how much work a tech transfer office undertakes, but they don't have much of a role if you're trying to trace particular inventions from disclosure to public benefit on reasonable terms. Mm, mm, mm. Well, Gerald, thanks so much. This has been incredibly informative, and I really appreciate your perspective on these issues. It's really been quite enlightening for someone looking in from the outside to hear your perspective. Glad to be on. Charles Moore, May 9, 1939. My speech today is why I like for girls to wear short dresses. Well, a few days ago in class, we were talking about subjects that were supposed to be dull. Well, today I decided I'd talk on statistics. This is supposed to be a dull subject. Several years ago, in fact, about 45 years ago, a man started studying a correlation of short dresses and long dresses with prosperity and depression. He has found in these 40 or 45 years the amount of the woman's dress as it comes up from the floor, or closer to the knees, shall we say, that it and prosperity have a high correlation. That is, that if the depression comes, the dresses drop, or rather the dresses drop, and then the depression comes. I don't know which it is, but there's a high positive correlation between these two. And so, for myself, since I want to be in an age of prosperity, give me long, shorter and better and shorter dresses again for the women. Thank you.